thank you very much, Marina. And thank you all of you for joining today in a, what I hope is just going to be a thought provoking discussion. And I say discussion because this topic of happy educational institutions designing for well being, I, I don't think it's been really done before. I feel like it's a very compelling idea, at least for me, and I want to share it with this community. I feel that um, I've been involved with Ashoka U for a number of years now, and I do feel like we're on the cutting edge of thinking about social impact and social change. So what I thought I could do is um, give you a, a few thoughts up front, and then we can, uh, I'd love to introduce a methodology appreciative inquiry by which we start thinking about how might we actually design our educational institutions for well-being. So I'm going to share screen now. And again, a, an invitation if you uh, feel comfortable turning on your webcam. It's lovely to, to see people, but I also understand um, some of the restrictions of doing that. So uh, hopefully you're seeing my screen now. And just a, a quick uh, intro uh, to myself. I'm, I'm originally from India. And um, I, let's, I came to my first Ashoka U, I think it was seven or eight years ago now, but I wanted to share a, 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 a short story about you know, why this topic of, of happiness um, and thinking about institutions that, that can promote happiness is important to me. Um, when I was 25 years old, I was living in San Francisco, working as a management consultant. And I remember then the, uh, the company, uh, AT Carney, it's uh, a reputed and growing management consulting firm, but they had a, a, a wallet card that I used to carry around, which all consultants did. And it said, clients come first, right? Um, fairly typical. And I, at, at 25 years old, I made a decision to, to not continue on that journey. I myself was realizing that I was getting paid very well for, for certainly at that stage in life. I had um, a job that was stable and I just felt that I was deeply, and I, I'm gonna put this in brackets, not happy, right? I had that sense. And so part of my journey for the last 23 years has been pursuing and understanding and unpacking happiness. And I've reached the point where a, a couple of years ago, I feel that like the journey of a social entrepreneur, social innovator actually is a very, very fulfilling journey if we think about the elements of, of well-being and happiness. Um, however, Part of the impact that we aspire social entrepreneurs and social innovators to make is to create organizations where people can experience well-being. And are we modeling that for ourselves? Are those institutions that are, you know, I would say the breeding ground for social innovation, where we're developing social entrepreneurs and innovators, are we giving them an example of what it is like to design an institution and to have an institution that truly encourages flourishing? That's the question that I'd like to bring to this group. And, and I, my, my, my hypothesis is that I don't think we're close yet. So when I left um, you know, management consulting, I, I ended up uh, uh, going to graduate school in education. And then for the last 15 years, I've been at the University for Peace in Costa Rica. Uh, I'm taking the call from Costa Rica right now. We actually have a positive leadership workshop running in parallel. And I want to share with you the lofty mission statement of the University for Peace. You can see it here in, in 60 words. Uh, and I'm going to say that despite such an aspirational and lofty mission statement about peace, the university itself is not doing many things institutionally to model peace and well being, right? And this is not to, to criticize, it's more to challenge the way some of our educational institutions have been set up, thinking about the impact on our students, but not necessarily on the communities, on our faculty, on our employees. And I think that's such a powerful message to you know, the end user. And I'm purposely using these terms because I, I, I think at the end of the day, we're just, we're an organization. Um, and, and so many of the components of 
organizational happiness apply here? Um, so I want to start off. This is this is very personal. Uh, I think of happiness as as a personal journey, and I also think of it as so important that we embed it in the 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 kind of. Um, I would say in, in the strategy and the DNA of our institution. So, but let's start at a very personal level. Can you share one practice that you've incorporated into your life um, that, that, uh, that brings you happiness, well being? So, just a quick chat in the chat box. So, if you're seeing, um, some of you have already used the chat box, it should pop up. Uh, I'm just going to type the message here. So, it pops up on your screen. What's one practice you have to incorporate happiness well-being into your life? Just take a, a minute to think about that. Thank you. Rafael is planting my own food, harvesting from my balcony, guided meditations, Marina, taking a walk in nature with your son, walking, so physical movement. Uh, stupid songs, joy, uh, time in nature, exercising, reading good books, growth, learning. Wonderful. And I think, um, you know, the idea that in a, in a pandemic, I think many of us have become more aware, actually, of what are those things that um, we can double down on that, that, that help us be happy because some of the avenues have been cut off. So, um, Thank you all of you, Raphael, change making, running impact projects, worship, uh, Lisa, wonderful. So we all, we all connect with this concept of happiness and well-being at a personal level and know how important it is for us uh, and have certain practices that we do. So um, what I wanna now move the discussion to is, you know, so why is institutional happiness such an important thing to, to talk about and consider? Um, and then let's talk about the leadership challenge of doing that. And then the, the last piece is where uh, really, because this is an open question, it's a design question. And all of you, you here are influencers in this space. We'll have some time for to, to really in breakout rooms, think about how might we do this. So, um, you know, just from, from my work with organizations, if we were to ask leaders in, 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 let's think about companies now, okay? But let's purposely call it uh, uh, companies rather than, than institutions or educational institutions. If you say, what, what's important to you? Um, typically people would say, you know, it's our finances are important our customers uh, are important, and then our employees, our, our engagement, employee engagement is very, happy, is very important. However, um, while we typically have tools, sometimes just in time tools to know how we're doing on the financial side and on the customer service side, um, we rarely have such data or metrics to know how are people really doing. Often I'm working with a couple of companies now in Costa Rica where they do an annual survey. So by the time the, the data is compiled and comes back to them, it's, it's old data, right? So they, they recognize the importance of in, in, in around the world, you know, attracting and retaining the best people is so important, yet we don't put together the, the same tools, uh, even though we know that, it, that, that it's paramount. So um, what uh, the, 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 some of the benefits and the, the data now has been collected for over a decade or so, but when you invest in your employee happiness, there are certain things that happen. You know, so burnout goes down. People take fewer sick days. People stay longer. All of those um, are very expensive for companies, of course, when, when people leave jobs or, or burnout. And then um, on, on the top side, uh, you know, just potential is unlocked, right? And these are different studies. It's, this is a one slide kind of capturing a number of studies that have done from innovation, retention, people are more creative, collaborate better, which, which basically raises productivity in organizations. So while we have robust information now uh, across typically corporations, and, and, and by the way, the, the, when, when 
people are trying to decide which company to work for, there's quite a lot of data based on those annual surveys on happy places to work, right? Um, universities, typically universities, and I looked through a number of rankings, um, are judged by how their students are doing, like what do they go on to do in terms of jobs? Do they graduate in at high percentage rates? What's the reputation of the university? This is a peer survey. So you ask different presidents of university, you know, what do you think of this university and that? Oh, that's a great university. But the reputation is based on some of the other metrics, right? Which is, again, student satisfaction, academic quality uh, through research papers published, the percentage of faculty that are PhDs, uh, how selective the university is, and then financial resources, endowment, and you know, these metrics on, on ranking universities have virtually nothing to do with the, the environment of the university, right? Well-being of faculty and uh, the, the, the host of administration, faculty, and the host of other stakeholders, I would say, um, that work in a university. This is a complete disconnect. Um, so what I want to ask here is what are some reasons you think educational institutions should focus on design, designing happy environments. So that's, that's my thesis. I feel like there's a disconnect and I'm going to kind of open it up at some point for, for, for an appreciative process on how we can do that. But I, I just love to hear, uh, this is also for you. If you want to unmute yourself and say something or, or ask a question or certainly add, add a comment, um, that's a possibility, but feel free here to also use the chat box if that's easier. What are some reasons educational institutions should focus on designing happy environments? And I'm going to stop sharing so I can, I'm in gallery view, I can see the, uh, those of you who, who are on. So I am going to, like I said, encourage you to use the chat box, but uh, Kara, can I ask you any thoughts you have on this? Why, why, why is that important? Sure, yeah, I was just typing in um, that it just seems like a really integral part of building a, you know, a meaningful, purposeful community. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, there's a happy staff, you know, a happy staff. Um, it's just a more pleasant environment. And I'm always thinking about you know, how much of our lives we spend with with work or school and, and that it's really important that those be um, supportive and pleasant places to be spending your time. Thank you, Kara. About a third of our lives, right? Uh, approximately. Yeah. It's a huge amount, 90,000 hours. Um, Marina, unlocking full potential of the intellectual and emotional resources in the community, in the campus. The research supports it, Natalie says. As many institutions focus on research, we should live by what we discover. Yes, isn't that I, the irony of all the research about happy institutions is coming out of universities and it's outward focused. Thank you, Natalie. So true, collaboration thrives and is sustained, right? Universities, I mean, some universities are now trying to dismantle the silos, um, but collaboration across happy institutions. Retention, right? We've seen the data on retentions, of course. Rafael, similar to Amartya Sen, like GDP is not what really matters for a country. Growth, happiness, or well-being should matter more at universities too. Thank you. You know, it's. I would say that it just like we have the Declaration of Human Rights, the right to education, the right to clean water, and the right to be in institutions where we can flourish, where we can be happy should be a basic right, right? And to understand the skills required to do that. In fact, the United Nations late in the game, but 2013, now there's a day in March, I think it's two days from today, 20th of March is the um, United Nations International Day of Happiness. So we preach this at universities, we do the research on happiness at universities, and yet we don't actually enable our own environments often, I would love to hear of exceptions and best practices that allow our faculty and administration to, to do this. Um, so thank you. So, so the, the one additional point I wanna make, and I think this is, this is so important, as you know, thought leaders in the space of social innovation education, uh, 
we are graduating people, change makers, we're asking them to have a social impact on issues that you know, are big and, and hairy problems for the world. We're asking them to do this in a financially sustainable way. And we're asking them to build organizations where people can flourish, but we're not giving them on the third part, I don't think we're giving them really the tools and we're not modeling that for them. So I think it's the unwritten curriculum. Because otherwise, I would argue, what if, what if somebody created, let's say, Mohammed Yunus, right? Because we, we've, we've heard of Grameen Bank. They employ hundreds of thousands of people. What if the work they were doing was only benefiting their, their, their lenders, but everyone who worked in Grameen Bank was miserable, right? We'd be creating almost as big a problem as we're solving. So I think it's, it's, it's essential. It's part of the unwritten curriculum to be able to model best practices in institutional happiness. Um, and I have yet to be in an institution that's truly doing this. I've seen pockets of it, which is, which is what, um, which I really want to uncover. So, so thank you all for um, uh, responding to this and adding your thoughts. And, and so the short of it is ha employee happiness is a win at many levels. This was actually an HBR cover issue seven years ago now. Um, and it was talking about those metrics that can be quantified, right? Like retention, attracting the best people, less burnout. Um, it wasn't getting to the importance of modeling for future social innovators what a happy environment um, looks like. So not so easy though. Uh, the question is, you know, how can we help design happy educational institutions if we, um, you know, if, if happiness itself is a complex idea. So uh, this is where, you know, being from India, maybe, maybe you were able to tell or not, but I, I went to the most famous Indian I could think of who's uh, Mahatma Gandhi. And he says, happiness eludes us if we run after it. Oh, so now it's a little bit, that doesn't really help me. But Mahatma Gandhi, as you know, is, uh, you know, Happiness wasn't his area of study. He was, it was, it was nonviolent movement. So instead, I turned to Martin Seligman, who, um, you know, I would say has done some cutting edge, robust uh, cross-cultural research over a few decades now, uh, known as the father of positive psychology. And I, I want to give you as a starting point, uh, at least the research from the School of Positive Psychology on what is, what are the pillars of, of, of happiness. What I'm going to challenge us to do when I, after I run through the five pillars of happiness is really to think about it in the organizational context of educational institutions. But first, um, let's go through the, the, these, these five pillars. By the way, quick, quick caveat, um, I've been delving into the research on well-being and happiness for a little bit over a decade now. And I would love to add the plus at the end of PERMA. So while I feel this, this research is robust, um, Seligman hits himself would, would, would say that this is, this is a framework and there's more that individual differences because he didn't talk to you, right, Raphael, or didn't talk to you, Kara. Um, so there might be things, if movement is something that's very important to you and it's not captured here, that you should definitely feel to, that you should add to this framework. But I wanna go through the five pillars that, um, that we know are very important at the individual level, at the organizational level. So the P of uh, PERMA stands for positive emotions. Okay, and um, perhaps this is the one that's easiest to relate to. There's a lot of, um, I'd say a lot of emphasis on, on positive emotions, joy, you know. In fact, it's been commercialized to a certain extent. You, you know, go to this beautiful vacation and you'll be happy or drink Coca-Cola and you'll be happy because it produces joy. And, and um, positive psychologists would say, firstly, these are, there's more than, than just the smiley face. It's, it's, it's an emotion like gratitude, which can be called upon at any time. As long as you're alive, there's something to be grateful for. Or even the idea of you know, serenity, um, awe in front of 
uh, beauty of nature or awe in front of a, a great idea. Uh, so these are the top 10 most uh, frequently experienced positive emotions. Actually, the research comes from Barbara Fredrickson, who not surprisingly is at uh, a university in California. Um, so so these, the research is being done at our educational institutions, right? Um, so a quote from, from Barbara Fredrickson on positivity, uh, she says, the first core truth about positive emotions is that they open our hearts and our minds, making us more receptive and more creative. Yeah. So without necessarily going into uh, the science of it, I want you to start thinking about how in your spheres of influence, how might you um, start fostering more of these kinds of emotions, right? Because I, I've walked into, you know, as a professor, I, I encourage critical thinking, right? So, so challenge me, you know, let's, let's get into the ideas and it's not personal, it's about the idea. Um, and, and, and that may or may not produce these, right? So then is there a different way of even starting if you're a professor of starting a class with gratitude? Right. Um, so the research on positive emotions is 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 robust, and the question is, how can we do more of this uh, in our educational institutions? By the way, um, if you look at this list, these don't cost anything, right? It's not Google putting a cafeteria that gives free food and free sushi. It's it's about asking questions, structures that might uh, help us with. Um, with these emotions, right? So it's not about infrastructure. Um, so I wanna move on to the, the. by the way, please at any point um, uh, come off mute to, to ask a question or make a comment. Um, as I said, we'll move into breakout rooms in the third uh, section of, of this, but don't wait for that. So the of the five pillars, the second pillar of PERMA is E, which stands for engagement. Now, this is where you may not always associate happiness with engagement, but the definition of engagement is knowing your strengths and being able to use them. It's as simple as that, knowing your strengths and being able to use them. So, you know, you may have heard that um, the Myers-Briggs tool, like the MBTI, um, is, is one, you know, one tool that corporations just have a lot of their employees do it so that they can know their strengths better and how to use them. Again, ironically, I feel, and then of course the strengths finder, we use the VIA strength survey a lot in the work we do. Ironically, corporations are using these tools much more than I have seen used in higher education, at least with faculty and, and staff in terms of, and now in the last year, most faculty and students alike and, and, and universities have transitioned to, to working virtually, right? So even if you had teams and departments where people knew a little bit about each other's strengths, now it's, it's a whole new game. So the ability for educational institutions really to bring that research that has gone to the outside world and bring it inside, um, would allow people to have a much better understanding of their strengths and how they can put it to play, especially when you're working with teams, right? Um, I think one definition of leadership coming from Peter Drucker is leadership is putting people in places where weaknesses don't matter because everybody's playing to their strengths and you've created an alignment of strengths. Right? That requires um, people really taking the time to dig into strengths-based uh, understanding. So I would recommend here the VIA Strength Survey. It's free. If you just Google it, it's, it's about 120 questions. You can, uh, one thing you can try with your teams. If you look at this list, the idea is we have all of these. They just are in different, um, in different orders. So once you get your feedback, the question is how can you, how can you do it? Um, how many of you, by the way, have done, I'm just going to stop sharing. How many of you have done the VIA strength survey? Any of you just say yes in the, okay, so Kara, you have. 
lovely. So, so some of you have, some of you uh, haven't. And I do feel that um, it's one that, because part of these, these surveys are self-reported data. Um, the, I went deep into the methodology. It's, it's very, it's been now, I think there's maybe four or 5 million people who've taken it. So they've been able to make a very robust assessment. Um, and it doesn't pigeonhole. One of the criticisms of these tests is that it gives you things that you should be doing versus, versus the level at which the VIA gives you uh, your feedback. Thank you for sharing that resource. So um, let me move on now to um, the next pillar of, of well-being, uh, which is R. Any guesses what the R stands for? Maybe not super hard. It is relationships, right? Sorry, Kara, you were unmuting to say I beat you to it. Sorry. Um, the it's a relationship. So you know this is um, a quote from Sean Aker, a positive psychologist. He says the greatest predictor of success and happiness at work is the quality of your relationships and social support. Not 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 very complicated, right? So it's not necessarily how many research papers you've, you've published or, or your student evals, if you're a faculty or if you're an administration, the department, you know, all of that, maybe we'll see other correlations with PERMA, but single greatest predictor of, of, of happiness at work is, is relationships. And yet we tend to underinvest in our relationships. Anyone want to take a crack at why do we underinvest in our professional relationships? Any thoughts? We underinvest in. Hey, you know, um, uh, Marianne, do you want to grab lunch and let's catch up? It's been a while. Why doesn't that feel such great use of my time to do that with a colleague? Maybe. So yeah, uh, yeah, Kara, go for it. Kara, go. I think Marianne should go. I've already said. Oh, yeah, Marianne. Well, I mean, it, it, it's, it's okay. Why? There are so many reasons. And I don't know. In the end, it's probably lack of time or maybe lack of awareness. We are not really aware how important it is to stop and to take the time. Yeah. Let's yeah. 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 That's great. And, That's great. And, 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 Cara, did you want to jump in or? Oh, sorry, I missed the prompt. I, I, that's pretty much what I was saying is there's just this like productivity mode that you get in and that it's all about accomplishing tasks and, um, and relationships kind of are in the not pressing um, quadrant. So we don't prioritize them, yeah. Definitely. So, so especially if, if systems are aligned to, you know, whether it's the research you've published or the number of classes you teach, and there's not an alignment between building relationships with your colleagues and what you're rewarded for within the system, right? And then the research on, on psychology and happiness is not very well known. Um, and you don't get that instant kind of feedback if you have lunch with a colleague, you don't get a sense that your email box has has less emails. If you spend that hour instead, you know, having lunch at your desk and answering emails, it would be that'd be a signal that you got some work done. So for many reasons, we we don't invest in the greatest predictor of happiness at work. By the way, that kind of time builds trust. When you have trust with your colleagues, things go much faster. So it's also very efficient when you want to collaborate and get stuff done. Um, so relationships is while it's a it's an obvious thing we know that positive relationships make us happy we underinvest in it at work and and one concept that i won't go into because of time but i want to just share it is this concept of psychological safety it's fascinating research by dr amy edmondson who's at harvard business school google of all companies picked up on this because google still works in team structures and they were trying to figure out how can they set up teams so that the teams are high performing? You know, how do you compose teams so that they're high performing? And they had a lot of theories. They did a multi-year study called Project Aristotle and they showed the, the single biggest predictor of successful teams at Google are teams that had established psychological safety. 
you know, it, it, a very analytical approach to tell you something that we probably know intuitively, that when people trust each other, when people can be themselves at work, um, uh, things work well, right? And again, ironically, research coming out of universities, going outside, being picked up by some of the biggest and most successful companies, we need to apply this inside of our in educational institutions. So ch check out Project Aristotle. There's a wonderful article that was in the New Yorker that, that talks about the study. So the M of PERMA, moving on to the fourth pillar is meaning. And here maybe, maybe easier, maybe we have an easier time because meaning is the sense that our life matters and that our work impacts others. So at universities, my guess is that is something that should be happening really well, right? Because we are, in fact, all our metrics are about our students and where they're going and things. And I would ask you to reflect on this question. You know, you may be at an accounting unit in a university. You might be in that administrative thing where you've been trying to manage a budget and spending. How can we stay deeply connected to our why, the why that got us into these educational institutions? Because we can disconnect, right? And it takes leadership to keep people connected to the impact we're having. I, I would say, hopefully, this is obvious, right? And may, maybe less obvious when you're working virtually. But um, so the last pillar of PERMA and is, is the A. And the A stands for achievement. We all, in addition to experiencing positive emotions, in addition to using our strengths, in addition to having positive relationships and meaning in our work, we want to have a sense of achievement. We want to have a sense that the things that we are tracking or that matter to us, we're getting better at, okay? And here I would just say that um, depending on your context, sometimes it's, it's we're, we're going into our day-to-day, -day, it's, it's the, you know, the whirlwind of emails and meetings and, the, and, and how are we internally feeling like we're accomplishing things. So there might be even an opportunity area here um, as, as we think about our spheres of influence in universities to allow ourselves and our teams to get a sense that we're making progress to that end goal. The end goal might be graduating really responsible leaders, right? The next generation of change makers. But are we getting a sense of satisfaction and accomplishment ourselves in the process. So that's what I wanted to share with you in terms of the pillars of well being. And like I said, the reason I shared this with you is while this applies at an individual level, it's really important for us institutionally to think about how we're doing it. So let me pause here for a second and um, stop sharing before we go into appreciative inquiry, which is now it's, I'm really gonna turn it over to you to ask a few questions, to think about how can we do PERMA? Uh, what's going well? What could we dream? about and how do we design it? So we've gone through PERMA, questions, comments, thoughts at this stage. Yeah, I have a question. Yes, Rafael. Uh, I'm really puzzled because uh, I've been working a lot and studying a lot through this pandemic about PERMA culture. And since I saw the, the, you know, the title of your talk and I saw PERMA and you are talking about PERMA nonstop. So I'm really, Concern, not concern. I'm really curious to know if you, it, it's. I mean, it's obviously related, especially when you are speaking about engagement, about uh, everybody putting his best effort, his best quality into a project. That's what I, I try to get from my students in, in our social impact projects. Thinking of permaculture, and uh, I would like to to hear you on this relationship between your perma and permaculture and. Oh, it's just know, a coincidence. Or... Yeah. Oh, you know what? I think it's just a coincidence. I don't know much about permaculture. If I did know a little bit more, I think I'd be able to make some connections back to the perma framework. Because just your energy from speaking about it, about permaculture, I feel 
that probably in that process of engaging your students, Raphael, there's probably positive emotions. There's probably the sense I'm using my strengths. There's probably also building of relationships and it's meaningful. It, it's probably a very sustainable way to do agriculture. And there's a sense of accomplishment because it's non-traditional. So I would say permaculture might be an example of taking perma and creating an institutional project or approach, but it is a coincidence that one is permaculture and the other is perma. But I would challenge you, and I think, I think you're doing that already, Raphael, is if permaculture, if you're finding it's working so well, my guess is that it is linking back to many of these pillars of well-being that, that I've just shared from, from the field of positive psychology. Yeah, absolutely, and it's, it's really related or very much connected and actually uh, it goes well beyond uh, agriculture and, but permaculture is about permanent culture it's about we human beings remain on this earth <laughs> so it's uh, it's it starts with uh, agroforestry organic production and so on and so forth but it goes well beyond and renewable energies and also it goes more into a philosophical way of living. Let's say believing there is no way to think like that. But I, I won't see. take much time. I was just curious to know the, the relationship. Yeah, no, that's wonderful. You know, because one of the things I would say as, as educators who are promoting social innovation, right? Pathways for our students to be social innovators, to be change makers. I actually think we are doing what the school of psychology would say is the best way to experience happiness. Because in our departments of psychology, we unpack and understand positive psychology. I think in our, in as promoting the journey of a social innovation or, or of a change maker, we allow them to live the pillars of PERMA, right? And my guess is that permaculture is one of those things that like Gandhi says, you can't chase happiness. Right. You can do something that's aligned with PERMA. And, and so, so, sorry, just just to, again, without knowing as much about permaculture to, to respond well, um, I think the, the focus that I, I want to put on, on this session is that the missing piece for us is often applying this internally to our own organizational structures and our own teams. Uh, th thank you, Raphael, for 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 bringing up that, that uh, doubt and question and making the connection. Um, any other comments or thoughts before we go forward? Okay, so let me now um, go into appreciative inquiry. So this is where I thought that if we're going to dig into what could we do better, and we're talking about happiness, how can our institutions be happier? to allow that to be a role model for our students, we should adopt a methodology that also, uh, uh, that also comes from the, the field of positive psychology. And some of you may know of appreciative inquiry, but it's taking the research out of positive psychology and putting it in really what is a four-step process. And first, a, a definition, appreciative inquiry, it's a strengths-based approach to change applying the pillars of positive psychology. Problem solving is often what we do. We're really trained at finding the problem, doing a root cause analysis of the problem, and then trying to fix it. Appreciative inquiry takes a different path. Uh, source of the words. So appreciate is to value. It's to recognize the best of. It's to ask the question, what's working really well? It's That's the mindset. Um, it's like when you meet somebody new, you immediately, the appreciative eye starts looking for what you enter a room or an institution, what are the strengths of this institution or this infrastructure? Not from an evolutionary point of view, we're not wired that way, right? We're, we're very good at like looking for problems and what's dangerous. So it is, it is a, a different kind of mindset and training. So that's half of it. The other half is, inquiry 
An inquiry is what you do with that appreciative lens. You dig deep, you ask questions, you explore, you discover, you're open to seeing new possibilities. So when you put those two together, it's a way of inquiring that's strengths-based, but you're seeking for change and transformation. And I thought that's the lens we could use as we think about how can we build our higher ed systems to, to be these happy institutions since, since we're since that would be a super rich part of the hidden curriculum in change make, making. And last couple of theory things before we get into this is uh, one of the principles of appreciative inquiry is the positivity principle, focusing on the positive causes it to grow and brings out the best in people and organizations. Why is this true? Our brain is not able to take the millions of pieces of stimulus. And so what we focus on uh, just grows. Um, lots of research supporting this. And then the simultaneity principle, the idea that inquiry and change happen simultaneously. The act of asking questions begins the change process. So it doesn't matter so much what we come up with, but as soon as I start put, putting up questions, I'm actually directing energy of you know, the 16 or 18 people here towards that change. So whether you like it or not, uh, the inquiry is simultaneously getting our heads into that space of what could we do. Um, last thing, because I do think as, as educators, um, as change makers, this process we can use in, in any of our educational processes. So I wanted to just share with you, uh, a lot of this information is open source, but it starts with always asking the question, what's working well? That's called the discovery phase. And then we go into the dream. What might be possible once you've connected with your assets and what's working well? And then you go into the design mode, right? It's volatile, it's uncertain, but how can we act? Everything is, it's not about failing or succeeding. It's giving ourselves space to move forward and experiment. And the destiny phase is once we have a new reality, we don't want to take a couple of steps back. How do we make it stick? So those are the four Ds. And we'll go through the first three these together in the next half an hour. All right, so this is where I'm just slight warning. I know in conferences, there's a lot of multitasking going on for many, many reasons. We just need to be, we're committed, we're double committed. And so at this point, very soon in the next half an hour, I am going to put you into breakout rooms. And I'm going to ask you, so if, if you were distracted, even if you jump in fully now, you'll be able to really participate in the breakout rooms. Um, so first question I want to ask you is, is the discovery question. Thinking about PERMA, positive emotions, engagement, relationships, meaning, and achievement, please share practices in your small group that are currently working well at your institutions, things that your institution is doing that is actually aligned with PERMA, that's producing well-being and happiness, not just for the students, but internally too. And then what score would you give your institution on, is it a happy institution? If you say two, something's working well because otherwise you would have given it a zero, right? So the starting point is sharing some best practices on your institution in helping create PERMA. I'm gonna put you in breakout rooms, but before I do that, I wanna ask you if there are any questions about the question I'm asking you, is it clear what I'm asking you to do? Mohit, just one maybe recommendation. We've found that sometimes there are already audio problems when people have gotten into breakouts because they haven't yet tested their audio. Um, and so, uh, and for that, and because some people may not be comfortable going on video, um, I'd actually recommend you doing uh, larger breakouts and that some people will then have the option. I also know about four people have joined in the last 10 or 15 minutes who may not have felt they got enough context to jump straight in. So I think I would encourage people to not go into the breakout or hop out back to the main room if they just wanna chat with you during this time to ask more questions about the content. Um, and then if there's enough people in each breakout, then those that are comfortable sharing on audio and video and have it all working can do so. And then those others can listen in. Wonderful, thank you, Marina. So usually I'd have smaller breakout rooms, but I'm gonna put you in breakout rooms about five to six. So even if it's two or three of you, uh, that should that should be a robust size. And then if you want to hop out and talk to me, I'll of course be here. So the question is sharing best practices now on what is your institution doing that is actually maximizing well-being 
thinking about PERMA. Um, and if you want to give your institution a score of one to 10, might be interesting to hear how you rank it on the happiness scale. So I'm going to create that. how long is this one again? This one's yeah. the... Yeah, I'm going to give you about, um, let's, say, let's call it six minutes for this breakout room. Great. Okay. okay, so three rooms, there's going to be five participants per room. Okay. All right, so I think everyone's back. My guess is time went by pretty fast, especially if you're going around and saying, you know, introducing yourself and things. So um, what, so I have two options. Uh, what I am going to do actually, because I just see the distribution of the rooms, I'm going to re when I recreate rooms, I am going to mix you up again, right? You'll be with different people, which is fine. Part of it, certainly one of the things that I've gotten out of Ashoka U is meeting new people. So it's all right if, if some of the time is just that, uh, but I will give you a second guiding question. And that second guiding question is now getting to the dream. So are you seeing my screen again? Okay. So the dream question is as follows. It's often a version of this question when you have people dream, but the dream is a year from now. So you fall into this deep sleep tonight and you wake up and, oh my God, it's 2020, sorry, two, 2022, March 18, 2022. So you've slept for a year. And during this deep, long sleep that you had, your university and now is truly allowing all its stakeholders to flourish and experience well-being, certainly students, but also faculty, staff, and, and it's, it's this happy institution that's modeling well-being. What looks different? As you, I mean, are you still on campus? Are you interacting virtually? Um, just think about what, what has changed um, for, for you to feel like your institution is truly now allowing you to experience some of these pillars of PERMA. Um, so if you didn't give your university a 10 on the last question, something may, must have changed unless it was doing everything perfectly. Okay, so this is the dream. What could be even better? So I'm gonna stop sharing, make sure the question is clear. Yeah, thumbs up if I can see it. Okay, and I'll put you into a different breakout room. So I'm gonna recreate. I'll keep it at three rooms or do you want me to make it four? So it'll be slightly smaller rooms. Anyone thoughts on that? Let's keep it at three, okay? So four people per room, five minutes. <laughs> right, well, having everyone back. Um, how did that go? Yeah, okay. So third question is the design question, right? And let me put it up for you. And then what I might do with this question is actually put you back exactly in the same breakout rooms uh, because then you can build on your last conversation. So uh, the trade-off is you won't meet new people, but the design question is reflecting on the dream that you just shared and the framework of PERMA. What can you do more of? What should you do less of and what can you start doing that you're not doing now? And here, think about this at, at an individual level or at an institutional level in the sense that you can influence in many ways, right? So I don't, you all have different positions within these, these institutions, but what should you do more of? What maybe you should do less of and what's new that you should start doing? Those are the guiding questions for the design phase. Um, and it's really the idea of, it's a, it's an uncertain time ahead. And the designer is always, has the confidence to try, take a step forward and, and see how things go and, and learn from that experience. So giving, giving yourself permission to design for well-being. Um, so I'm going to, is the questions, questions clear? Okay, so last five minutes into the same breakout rooms. All right, welcome back, welcome back everyone. Um, it's a little lonely here when everyone goes off into their breakout rooms, but that's okay. As long as you're having a good discussion, which it feels like because people wait till that last minute and then come back. So um, I, I, I know this, these could be longer discussions, but certainly the, the goal of these 75 minutes um, was to, like I said, that simultaneity principle. When we start asking these questions, we start 
pushing forward or driving a change. And when you start having the dream of what could be, that sets in motion a change. And, and of course, um, you know, the goal would be here for you all in your spheres of influence to think about, um, is this important? Do I think this is important? And what can I do about it? Um, and so my, my own sense is that um, this is, I think this is, this is very, very important for, for many levels, not only for the people who work in these institutions, if you think about faculty and employees across universities, I don't know, millions of people across the world. So it's, and by modeling happy institutions, we give our social innovators, our change makers templates to go out and create even better, happier institutions where people can flourish. So of course, now we're beginning to see in the curriculum, some courses on how do you build, you know, happy institutions, but far and, and few between. So it's, it's, it's definitely something that uh, I think we're on the, the forefront of, uh, and you, you chose to come to this session with a variety of other sessions going on. So maybe just to wrap up, I'll, I'll share, uh, screen again. By the way, of course, happy to connect with anyone. I'll have my contact information. Uh, we, the question that we didn't do is the, the destiny question, because that's once you've implemented, how do you make this stick? So that's, we're not ready for that question yet. Um, myself, I've been really thinking about for about four years now, I've been coll collaborating with a Danish gentleman. He's here on campus with me now. Um, we thought that four organizations, often PERMA might be too many pillars. Um, and so we have a model that's purpose, compassion, and strengths. Purpose, how do we stay connected to purpose? How do we really develop compassionate leadership and strengths-based leadership? And somehow the PERMA fits into these. So um, the I, I reach out to me if you're interested in any of this. I can make available the PDF of the book for you. Uh, mm -hmm. But that's the framework we've been we've been working with, and then uh, we also know that if you don't start m measuring these things, right? How do you know it's working? So the motivational landscape is the tool that uh, his name is Lars uh, put together. It's ten questions. It allows organizations, institutions, universities to have a quick feedback, a pulse survey, so that when you implement these changes, you can use this to, to get a sense of how are people actually doing in these areas of, uh, are they feeling connected to purpose? Are they feeling that they are able to use their strengths? And are they feeling that, um, you know, last one is compassion, is, the, is their leadership environment a compassionate one? Um, and, and the, the reason uh, this has been important for me is uh, I just feel that the world needs these happy educational institutions that connect not just head, which we're very, very good at developing, but also really brings the heart into it. And so a lot of the work that um, 15 years ago, I started a center for executive education within the University for Peace. Um, so part of my own approach to creating a happy institution is to <laughs> you know, champion one and design one myself, but it becomes a small pocket. And, and all of our courses have at the heart of it, um, how can we think about happiness at different levels? Uh, but I'd love to uh, connect. I know this is a, a very, very, I would say, influential network, but also like-minded people coming together. My Over my years, um, I can't track back all the wonderful things that have happened through the people I've met through this conference. So Marina, I know you are uh, you know, fortunate to have you here for me and for the others, uh, but a lot of gratitude to you for having uh, put together something 15 years ago that has really, really impacted so many, so many thousands of people uh, in so many ways that we can't, can't keep track of. But uh, that's what I had to share. Of course, now, I, I know time, we're officially out of time. I don't know when the next session is, but I'm happy to stay on uh, for a few minutes at least if there are questions or comments. But just, I know many of you have to move on. So thank you so much for joining. And I was just curious, if, is there a link to download the PDF or can you upload it in the chat here? Or is it something that is better for people to email you separately? Yeah, I think, let me just chat, put my thing. I, I would have to, um, I wouldn't be able to upload it immediately, but I could definitely get it to you. I would check with the author. Uh, okay. So I, 
I oh, will never yes. mind that. Yep. So people can email you separately. Then maybe just drop your email in the chat since you've taken this slide off. Perfect. Yeah. Did you see it? It just popped up. I, I just typed it. I'll type it again just so that everybody see it, sees it again. So it's mohit at ups.org. Is it popping up in your chat? It should it should have at least a couple. Yeah, really okay. Thank you. That was incredible. So much good content. I'm so glad there's so much science back and research backing up the importance of all of this. Now we just need to apply it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, so in so many across fields, I see this. So we shouldn't feel bad where the research supports what we should be doing, but then we don't do it. And, and yeah, that's the, it is a challenge. So it's not different from maybe other things, but so important, especially for people who I think are developing future organization builders, future change makers, to give them a template of a, of a flourishing organization. Oh, this is great. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Uh, there were a few people who joined yeah. late who wanted to get some of the access and we'll have videos available in the next couple of weeks, but it, are you able to share the PowerPoint as well if they contact you separately? Definitely, great. definitely. I tend to make it a PDF just from the Perfect. weight point of view, but if anybody, um, yeah, we can always upload it to Dropbox. But I usually if you ask me, I'll just make it a PDF and send it to you. Great, okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I want to ask you a question you. if I can. <laughs> Yeah, and if you, if those of you who need to drop off, please do, but Rafael, I'll, I'll stay on. Yeah. Thanks again, Marina. What about happiness at school? Because uh, we just had a, I don't know if you watch it, a striking, uh, that was really striking for me at least, striking talk by a non-speaking autist person. And uh, that was really impressive for me. And uh, about two years ago, less than two years ago, I went to an eco villa and I had the opportunity to visit the school they had there for small children, then from small children to teenagers. And I was, after 15 minutes there, I decided I would, I could move there just to have my child studying at that school. That, for that only reason, that would be enough for me to, to, to move there. Because it was totally different from the educational system we have, right? That it's not made for inclusion. Maybe you have this on, written somewhere but you don't really include people in. and there they have no classroom they actually they have the classroom but they should, the, the kid is allowed to go anywhere anytime and the, the teacher goes there and talks to the child and uh, when there is a conflict they they have a you know a forum <laughs> to discuss what's going on and it's it's really crazy i, I really was impressed there, there is no punishment of course there is no punishment it's read really about the empathy and trying to understand and so conflicts among, even among the smallest children possible. So I want to hear you a little bit on happiness in school, I mean, starting earlier. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I, you know, I, I'll say something that I don't know if it'll make sense initially, then I'll, I'll explain it. But I feel when it comes to education, I feel like a chef going to a not so good restaurant in the sense that I, I've, I've thought so much about the education that it's very unsatisfying the offerings that are available to my own kids, to the kids of my brother who lives in London, different continent. Um, and, and I just feel like I, I feel a little powerless because you know you found a school and you would move there. I've tried different things, private schools for my kids around different pedagogical approaches. And I'm almost personally have in my own family context, like trying to do the best I can without, you know, quitting my job and starting a school, right? Because I just think it's so far from what it could be and should be. Um, so that being said, Rafael, interestingly, the flip side of that is I was at a, well, it was an on, we have a five week online course uh, that we offer on organizational happiness. And I had a, a woman who was actually the principal of a school and she said to me after the course or the, the project she's working on, she's doing a lot of what you saw for the kids, but she felt that she hadn't actually, she wasn't doing it for the teachers and the staff. So I actually think that I have, you know, just like this wonderful school you described, because I, I, I study this and look for bright spots, the idea of when something's going well, how do we do more of it? So I've come, even in Costa Rica, there are a few good examples of schools that I think are really focusing on on the children's happiness. I actually haven't 
seen one case study where they are actually doing it for the staff and the teachers, which is, of course, imagine you have unhappy teachers or the teachers are held to. And so my guess is that it's the unwritten curriculum that that anyone with that kind of vision to create a happy institution for the kids is probably doing it for the staff and the, the administration. But I think one without the other would be imbalanced and, and would affect it. So um, yes, so much is needed in that area. And I, I, I otherwise I think, you know, we're, we're clearly, um, when I think about the pace of change of, of the world, firstly, and, and what do we need to educate for? And then I think about other institutions and how fast they've adapted. I don't find, I, I, I feel schools have been generally, if you look at public schools, for many reasons, it's super, super slow, right? And again, I'm talking about a context that's limited to a couple of countries that I'm very familiar with. I, I, what, should, what should I call it, a, a tragedy? But I, I, I like to be optimistic, so yeah. I mean, I go, we live in a tragedy. <laughs> uh, and if uh, anyone else wants to ask a question, otherwise I have another one. <laughs> What's the risk of going into happiness washing, as we see green washing for farms? And uh, because my, my wife worked at a very demanding job at a very demanding company. And she said to me this morning, uh, oh, Wait a, wait a second, someone is knocking here. I'm sorry about that. Just, you know, home office. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I got the essence of it. Maybe I can just jump into it. Um, <laughs> I, no, I, I really, I'm yeah. afraid I'll have to leave, unfortunately. No worries. No worries. No worries. But I can, I, can, I can just share the, the thought of any kind of washing when it, things are inauthentic. Um, I think you can get sure. some believers, some people who say, oh, you know, I want to work here. But at some point, it's hard to, to, to be an inauthentic and for that to grow and people not to be able to see under the mask. So I think it's a short-term strategy, but not a long-term sustainable approach, yeah. What's happening there is basically that people are leaving work. I mean, because actually she got this invitation for a gathering for well-being at the workplace and she's not allowed to go because you know she has to work 10 hours a day. <laughs> I mean, she, she's allowed to go, but she can't. Nobody can at the workplace. And so basically that, that's what I would call happiness washing. They have, you know, this beautiful, someone did this folder. They are advertising this Thursday gathering for talking about well-being, avoiding burnout, but they all burned out. Uh, taking antidepressants and so on it's really terrible so they, they quit the job they just lose. which is which is yeah which is obviously a, a a heavy price for an organization to pay but that is exactly the first indicator that they need to do something different yeah thank you everyone i'm going to cut out i do have it's interesting i do have a group on campus but i am um really really again grateful to have this uh time with thank you very with much for joining Take care. Bye for now.